Hello, welcome to Task and Purpose First Squad. I'm your host, Chris Cappy. In this video about military news, we're gonna be talking about the Chinese military versus the US military. Who would win in a fight? So China thinks they can take on the US military. Let's see what they got. That is a really nice, that's a sweet slide right there. And look at that roll. How are we supposed to compete against that kind of roll? That's a combat roll if I ever saw one. If we were going head to head at a tug of war, yeah, I would be, I'd be terrified. So the Chinese infantry, they don't use body armor. That's okay, you got more mobility that way. It doesn't weigh you down. We could learn a thing or two about teamwork from the Chinese military. In my squad, if I asked one of my friends, hey, can I step on your head to jump over this wall? You know what they would say? No, Cappy. But they have a ton more troops and they're probably way more disciplined, if I had to guess, based on the squads that I was in. Or maybe those discipline levels were just low because I was in those squads. Many in the defense industry are saying that we're kind of in the footholds of a Cold War with China right now. Just five months ago, you look around and it looked like the two superpowers were gonna be able to dis resolve these disputes that they were having, but times have really changed very quickly. Today's episode will run down the main points of why top military analysts believe a fight between China and the United States might happen and how it would play out. I also have some of my own opinions in here, but this isn't set in stone. After the video, I wanna know what important things you think I missed out on or didn't get right so comment your thoughts below and let me know, and I'll try my best to answer. Instead of just guessing at what will happen, I base all this research on where each military is spending their defense budget. The 2020 defense budget for US forces were a total of $738 billion. And that should note, whenever the Rand Corporation or Jane Defense forecasts run the numbers, they find something strange about how China claims to spend the defense budget every year. There's an unofficial estimate of China's actual defense spending and that their government puts out every year. And then there are the private estimates. And one estimate puts their defense spending at around $500 billion a year. So it's quickly catching up to the US. You can draw your own conclusion as to why they've been misleading about their defense budget for decades. So China has essentially been lying and saying they're spending way less on defense than they actually are. And you can also point out that the US total defense budget by some estimates actually exceeds 1 trillion. So the United States might also be hiding some of their defense budget. The way people analyze this is by looking at how many tanks, infantry units, ships, etc., and then they reverse engineer the numbers and decide how much would it actually cost to build the equipment that they have. So both countries have massive military forces in relative close proximity to each other because there are still several regions in the world where they're vying for influence. In the past, whenever they ran analysis, it predicted that the US would most likely win in a fight against China. That's become way less likely over the recent years where they're now kind of at a point of a stalemate. We've seen the US forces invest heavily in underground fighting. They put $500 million into training how to fight in subterranean environments. And this is where I believe the US is most likely where they think they'll be fighting the next war. World War I was fought in the trenches. World War II was defined by mobility on the ground and in the air. I think World War III is gonna be the battle that happens in subterranean underground tunnels and subway systems. The reason I think many smart analysts are predicting this is because of drone warfare, which will make being on the surface basically suicide. Chemical and nuclear warfare are possible threats in confrontation between the world's superpowers, not to mention the insane conventional weapon power that has developed since World War II that would make being above ground a horrible decision. And here's the thing, since World War II, there's been this urbanization across the, across the globe where people are moving to urban environments. And in those urban, urban environments, there's subway systems and underground tunnels. So this is why many defense industry analysts think that the next war is going to be fought underground. The only reason wars past World War II weren't fought underground is that those countries didn't prepare for decades. And now you're looking at countries around the world that since 
the end of World War II, they've just been digging in. There hasn't been a major war since then, so countries have had a chance to build massive underground military structures for their Air Force, for instance. So you have North Korea and China heavily invested in building underground entire Air Force bases underground because they saw what happened to Iraq when the United States bombed, you know, shock and awe. They learned the lesson from shock and awe, which was you need to have your military forces underground or they're just going to get destroyed. And with drones, this is even more true. So if this Cold War carries on like the first Cold War with Russia did, we might be able to safely assume that the war with China would be fought through another proxy war. This could mean that China tries to grab more land. If the past tells us anything, it's that superpowers in the age of nuclear weapons will find a back doorway to fight against each other when all options are totally exhausted. It's not going to result in a direct confrontation under pretty much any circumstances whatsoever, but they need to find a way to compete for shared interests. So we have these economic proxy wars. Perfect opportunity and moment to do this video because I can do something on China without having to worry about the video getting demonetized right away. It seems like the Chinese military with their camouflage have taken some hints from the UCP camouflage that the US Army used to use. Their camo looks a little bit better though. It looks like a cross between the UCP US military camo and our OCP camouflage. Ghillie suits, I'm gonna have to rate these ghillie suits um, subpar. I've seen much better. These look like they, they bought it on Amazon, which is where you get all your crappy Amazon stuff from now. It all comes from China. Analysts today say that if a new world war were to kick off, it would likely happen in the South China Sea along the Mekong River. The Mekong River is something I'd never really heard about before researching this. And the possibility of a US-Chinese proxy war is going to possibly happen here on this Mekong River. It's nearly 5,000 kilometers long. The river runs through China, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. The water from this river provides life for the entire region. So, you know, the rice growing operations feeds over 100 million people. So both the United States and the US are invested heavily in, you know, they're putting tons of money into this area. And it's very controversial among world leaders because India is another location where defense analysts are pointing to and saying that this location is where a proxy war could break out because they favor the United States and they're so close to China. 60% of the lending from Chinese banks is to developing countries where critics say, these are debt traps and they're extending huge amounts of credits to these countries that are, might be unable to pay that back. You know, they're investing this money in the country so that they can so that they can build up their infrastructure and then they're in debt to that country for the next 100 years. So this seems like the natural evolution of super power proxy conflict. It's way less likely for them. It's way less costly for them to fight their adversaries economically than it is to fight in an actual war. Russia and China and the United States have been, mess have been investing their money in developing countries in exchange for influence. Another way of saying this is these countries give money to farmers and developers in the region so that when they want something, they can come back and get it. The major difference between this Cold War and a war with China or our previous Cold War with Russia is how interconnected our countries are now. The economy of the US and China depend on each other so much that they can't really afford to hurt each other too much. For the past 20 years, China has watched what the US is doing. They've copied what worked and they've focused on developing equipment and weapons that would be next generation. China has a numbers game approach to the military. They have massive amount of forces. It's for this reason. So Jeff Shogel wrote for a task and purpose, a very interesting article about the possible war with the US and China. And he, he starts off the article by saying, to paraphrase Tommy Lee Jones in No Country for Old Men, if China isn't the enemy, it'll do until the enemy gets here. When military leaders talk about China, they sound like they're ready to rip off their shirts and challenge the People's Liberation Army to a Mortal Kombat style tournament refereed by Pitbull High on Math. Don't believe me? Let's listen to Adam Philip Davidson, the head of US Indo-Pacific Command, who recently described China as the greatest long-term strategic threat to security in the 21st century. 
In stark contrast to our free and open vision, the Communist Party of China promotes a closed and authoritarian system through internal oppression and external aggression. China's pernicious approach to the region includes a whole of party effort to coerce, corrupt, and co-opt governments, businesses, organizations, and the people of Indo-Pacific. Davidson warned that as China increases its military buildup through 2049, the military balance in the Pacific is becoming increasingly unfavorable to the United States and its allies, so much so that he's advocating putting more missile defense on Guam and American territory about 2,500 miles from Beijing. So what Jeff is talking about here is how the United States and China are vying for influence in the region. And they're doing this by, you know, corruption and co-opting governments, businesses, organization. You know, when I went to Latvia for my, right before I got out of the army, my unit was mobilized to Latvia, uh, one of the Baltic states right next to Russia. They used to be part of Russia before the Soviet Union collapsed. And the one thing that they were worried about and they kept asking my unit about, because we were there to train the Latvian soldiers to go to Afghanistan, all the local people in Latvia kept asking, what would you do if Russia came and tried to take us over again? They were terrified of the idea of Russia was gonna try to take their independence away. And people were telling me about how Russia didn't even really need to roll tanks across Riga into Latvia. No, all they needed to do was buy up all the land there. And that's what they were doing. It's like you go and you buy up all their debt and all their businesses, and then you essentially own the country. So what's the point of firing a shot? Firing a bullet is the old school method of doing it. War is no longer about shooting. It's about influence. In the military's defense, China has been equally bellicose. Last year, the Chinese Air Force released a video that appeared to show a nuclear-capable aircraft. And no one should underestimate the Chinese military, which has the largest standing ground force and navy in the world. According to the Defense Department, most recent reports on the Chinese military superpower. So China's rapid military modernization and increasing assertiveness makes it the only competitor potentially capable of combining its economic, diplomatic, and military technological power to mount a sustained challenge to a stable and open international system, said Michael Chase, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for China. James Kitfield recently revealed in Yahoo News that the US military not only routinely loses against China in classified war games, but China has been winning such conflicts more quickly in simulations over the past decade. So you gotta take those simulations with a grain of salt because are they taking into account that the US probably wouldn't be fighting alone, it would be all of NATO. Whenever we war game the Taiwan scenario over the years, our blue team routinely got its ass handed to it because in that scenario, time is precious commodity and it plays to China's strengths in terms of proximity and capabilities. So that's David Ochomnik of the RAND Corporation. I, the RAND Corporation is where I get a lot of my research, research from. They're a great, great uh, resource. As it builds more aircraft carriers and amphibious assault ships, the Chinese military will have the power to intimidate countries such as Vietnam and the Philippines, as well as the ability to conduct operations elsewhere in the world, said Peter Singer, a strategist and senior fellow at the New America Think Tank in Washington, DC, another place where I get a lot of research from. So in, the, in Jeff's article here, he's continuing to outline how China is just vying for the influence in that area and it's hard for the United States to compete with that right now. Meanwhile, the United States finds itself in a situation as reminiscent of Great Britain during both world wars, when the Royal Navy had so many commitments across the globe that increasing the number of ships in one region meant taking them away from somewhere else. You know, that's a really good analogy because Great Britain, obviously, they had an empire that was all around the world at one point, and now it's really, really shrunk. So Jeff goes on to say, so we're all clear, I'm not an apologist for China or its ruling Communist Party, but there's a difference between being clear-eyed and objective about China as a national security threat and treating China as if it were Sauron from the Lord of the Rings, Sauron from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It does not appear that anyone in Pentagon realizes that a conflict with China would be a total war, which the United States has not waged since 1945. The last time the US military fought a war that scale in the Pacific, it ended with the world's first nuclear strike. Whoa, did you see that? 
they're able to roll not just their sleeves, but they also roll up their ankles. They show a little ankle. I like a military that shows a little bit of ankle. Look at this. Roll up the pant leg. Go five, six mile run. It's a good way to cool off. That's smart. You never see that in the US military though. They would never authorize rolling up the, that kind of, that level of no discipline. Just letting your, your ankles show like that. You don't want to tease the enemy. The Military Times, everyone, the Military Times has a great article about this also. So they talk about how the Pentagon war planners can envision a conflict with China starting in a number of ways. The, they fear a scenario that might involve a mass of Chinese military forces posturing along China's coast near Taiwan and the aggressive reorientation of Chinese missile systems that would set off alarms in Washington, DC. So everyone's kind of waiting and wondering when China is gonna make their move that they keep promising they're gonna make to retake Taiwan. But obviously the United States will not let that happen. Top military leaders in Indo-Pacific Command will brace for reports of cyber attacks, satellites shutting down, vessels crowding, and swarming various ships and ports across the South China Sea. More than a dozen experts contacted by Military Times described how this hypothetical nightmare could erupt fully. Perhaps as Chinese missiles start hitting targets in Taiwan, a conflict could spin out of control quickly as sensors across the region light up with simultaneous events, stretching the United States and its allies in every imaginable domain all at once. Among China's assets is the world's largest navy with a battle force of 350 ships that includes 130 major surface combatants. By comparison, the US Navy has 296 deployable ships. China's ground-based missiles have a range of 500 kilometers compared to the 300 kilometer range for US ground-based missiles in theater. It's a global contingency that Pentagon planners are now studying more than ever before, as both the US and Chinese military are setting up tripwires across the Pacific Rim that could draw the world's two largest powers into open conflict. And if you watch the last video I did, you can see this planning happening in action because the Marines and the army are reorganizing completely to fight this kind of battle. China's moves are so bold that the Pentagon has reoriented its entire worldview. The 2018 National Defense Strategy aims to shore up not only troops and weapons to deter a fight in the Pacific, but also to expand its network of allies in the region. Experts roundly agreed that immediate conflict remains unlikely given the huge cost in lives and treasure. Moreover, the nuclear weapons on both sides certainly serve to make leaders more cautious. But within the next decade or less, straining relations coupled with increased Chinese military capability could bring events to the brink. So here's an article I wanna show because I think it, when you hear all those facts about how China's military is way bigger and way more powerful, what you're forgetting is this, and this is a great article where they say, China wields by far the world's largest military with 2.8 million soldiers. Yet China's military was a full million people stronger in the 1980s before PRC leaders recognized that its size actually worked against their aim of developing a modern force. It's part of the reason why the US military is completely done with doing a draft because they didn't want they they only wanted volunteers they wanted only soldiers who wanted to be there and they knew that in order to make a military that had a lot of technology power they needed soldiers who were smarter and more competent and you don't get that from just casting a wide net with a draft two million of china's soldiers serve in the ground forces where their primary primary responsibilities are to ensure domestic order and protect borders, not to project power. Then too, the Pentagon estimates that only about 20% of those ground forces are even equipped to move about within China. A still smaller number possesses the trucks, repair facilities, construction, engineer units. So what, what we're saying here is, all right, if China has a missile that can fire 500 kilometers and the US 300 kilometers, all right, but how many of those missiles do they have? Can they actually really deploy those missiles like the US can? We need to talk about the F-35 real quick because everyone keeps saying that it's a terrible aircraft and it's a complete waste, but this is where the F-35 would shine in a air attack against a, another superpower. Given the importance of air power in America's recent war, it's not surprising that China has sought ways of neutralizing US capabilities in this area. Of great significance, the PLA has developed ballistic and cruise missiles that threaten forward US air bases. 
The China's People's Liberation Army has already surpassed the US in missile development and its number of warships and air defense systems under the Chinese Communist plan to achieve dominance by 2049. The ultimate goal of China is to develop a military by mid-century that is equal to or superior to the US military or that of any great superpower. This says that this is Chinese special forces training. I don't know if I believe that. For all I know, this could be in North Dakota. I'm laughing, but this guy would kick my ass. This just seems like abuse now. What added training benefit is the hose? Is the hose meant to just inspire you? I admire their perseverance, but it seems like a lot of this training is a little bit more dangerous than it's worth. Like if you, you know, you break your special forces and you break a leg doing one of these flips here, you're out, you're out on disability for two years. My leg would snap right here. It would just give out and you'd see bone. Well, if the measure of the strength of a military is in their ability to flip tires, then the Chinese military has us pinned. <laughs> I could just picture myself running <laughs> headlong into a tree if I tried to, if it was US, if it was me versus this Chinese soldier, I would, he would have me beat immediately.